Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Julia Myers, and I'm coming to you from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. And we are very excited for our program this afternoon on Florida's fall migration. And we will get started in just a second. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout the webinar at any point, feel free to use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And then our presenter, Brian Magnier, will answer all of our questions at the very end. But whenever you think about it, go ahead and put that question in the Q&A. And then if you've got any comments, concerns, go ahead and use the chat for that. And we want to give a big thank you to our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. They are supporting our program this afternoon. And if you're interested in learning more about the Friends or becoming a member, you can check them out at the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve.org. And we are very grateful for their support in all of our programming. We've got Brian Magnier here today, who is a good friend of the preserves and a wildlife photographer and ecologist. And he is going to talk to us about Florida's bird migration. So I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Julia. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, so today we'll talk about bird migration. Um, I did a pretty similar talk maybe a year ago and the skeleton of the talk is gonna be pretty similar. Maybe uh, some of you guys will remember that, uh, but I've definitely added a lot of slides, a lot of information. And we're really going to gear a lot more towards fall migration and the fall birds uh, and maybe some local sites where you can can start going birding in the next coming uh, weeks. Um, and so we'll breeze by some of the the other stuff that I covered in my earlier talks. So we're going to talk a bit about just general bird migration um, and the change of Florida's birds with the seasons, uh, where those birds go when they're not here in Florida. Um, how birds navigate during migration, um, some birds that you can find specifically during the fall and winter, uh, a little bit about molt, and then we'll end with some local birding hotspots. So it may seem like Florida doesn't really have uh, seasons. You know, it's pretty warm generally year round, um, you know, especially in the southern half of the state. And so you might think, oh, you know, the birds probably don't change that much either uh, throughout the year. Uh, and that is true for some birds and some plants, you know, many organisms can be found pretty much year round. Common things like the red shouldered hawk in the top right here and the St. John's wort in the bottom left. Those are organisms that can be found, you know, pretty much any time you want. You can go outside and find those without too much difficulty. But then there are some very seasonal things, things like the butterfly orchid and the swallowtailed kite that we have. You know, both of those can be found at Brooker Creek pretty easily in the summertime. Uh, and I love seeing those guys but you're not gonna be finding them this time of year. They're just not really there anymore. Um, and so there are seasons uh, to different wildlife you know, populations and what's visible at different times of the year. And to kind of detect this on a large scale, we can look at eBird data. Um, eBird is this big giant citizen science sort of conglomerate um, that has just tons of data and you can go outside and look at a bunch of birds and write down a list of what you saw and submit it to eBird. And that'll go right into their, uh, their platform as well for everybody else to, to look at and utilize. But anyway, so here we've got what are called bar charts. And it can look a little intimidating. There's a lot of stuff going on, but we'll walk you through it. Uh, so from left to right here, we're kind of going throughout the year, starting at January on the left, going to December on the right. And so we're looking at different birds. Those are in the kind of top to bottom. We've got different species of birds and how much they are seen, how many times they're seen throughout the year. And this is for Central Florida specifically. And so all of these species here, um, you know, there's lots of green. And so the big green blocks, the bigger the block, the more sightings have been reported to eBird. And so these are species that are resident in Florida pretty much year round. There are lots of sightings every month of the year. And if you'll notice, you know, these are a lot of our big wading birds, things like great blue herons, egrets, um, brown pelicans. And those guys, they're here pretty much year round because Florida's water sources are here pretty much year round. They don't freeze over in the winter. And so the food supply, fish, frogs, things like that, those are here all year round. And so you can find these wading birds here. They don't migrate away. The one exception on this list here is right at the top, actually, if you'll notice the American white pelican. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about those guys later. You'll notice that they don't really get seen in Florida during July, August, September, 
Uh, but then they will start coming back for fall migration and then over winter here starting in maybe October. And we'll talk about the white pelicans a little bit more later. If we look at the same sort of data for different species, here we have some that are pretty distinctly wintering birds. Uh, a lot of the ducks winter down in Florida because, you know, ponds and rivers are freezing up north. Um, and so if these guys want to be able to keep swimming around and doing their thing on water, they need to fly somewhere warmer like Florida, where it stays nice and thawed out all year. And then the ones we're most interested in today are the seasonal migrants, these neotropical migrants. Um, many of these are insectivorous, the insects, bugs. Uh, and so they'll migrate north um, to eat bugs in the summer. And then they'll migrate down south um, into a place like Central and South America in the winter. And so they'll pass through Florida um, in those in-between times in spring, April or May, or in the fall, August, September, October, and then into November. And we'll talk more about which species specifically um, to look out for in the fall, um, because a lot of these guys, you'll start noticing them in the next couple of weeks, peak migrations, you know, just about here. And so if you guys want to go out and see a lot of these warblers, um, I'll, I'll tell you guys where to find them, but we'll also uh, kind of talk about what to look for specifically. Uh, and that'll be you know, kind of closer to the end of the talk. So talks a little bit about, you know, what birds are migrating, which ones are staying, um, but where do they all go? Um, you know, when they're not in Florida, where are they and why aren't they here? And so the first thing to, to look at there is let's look at kind of a countrywide or a whole continent wide sort of scale and see where they're all going. And so here we've got a tree swallow and a map this is called a flame chart, also made by eBird. Um, and I can talk more about how these charts um, are put together at the end if you guys want. They're pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, here we've got a tree swallow. We're starting at the beginning of the year in January. And the orange, the brighter the orange is, basically means the higher the density of sightings. And so if we're in January, almost all the tree swallows are in the southern U.S., you know, southern California, with a huge density in Florida. If you're here in Florida in the winter and early spring, tree swallows are quite abundant. But if we click on it here and start this little GIF, we're moving through January, now we're in February, spring migration is starting, it's warming up. These guys eat bugs, so they're following where the bugs are going. March is here, and then April, and they're moving northward, up kind of just all the way north. They're not following one particular corridor. Uh, they're not following, you know, Mississippi River, or the coast. They're just all heading just due north pretty much. And then for June and July, they're all up in their breeding grounds. They've set up nests during the northern half of the U.S., southern Canada. And then they don't start coming back down uh, to Florida until here in September. And so right about now is when you'd start seeing tree swallows again for the first time of the year. Um, and then they kind of all concentrate and they get quite abundant in Florida for the entire winter. Um, and so that's something that we'll kind of notice as a theme today is a lot of our fall migrants in Florida actually linger, especially in the southern half of the state, because it does stay so warm and full of food throughout the winter. Uh, there's a similar sort of pattern if we look at palm warblers. This is one of the most common birds in Florida in the winter, but then they shoot straight up the Mississippi River and then into Canada. Canada. And for June and July, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a palm warbler anywhere in the United States. And then all of a sudden, bam, September, October come and they flow all the way back down right into Florida. Look at just a couple more of these real quick because I think they're pretty cool. Scarlet tanagers in the winter, see, they, they aren't even in Florida in the winter. They're one of the ones that's past Florida all the way down into Central and South America. Um, and then spring migration, they shoot up the Appalachians and then they go hang out up past New England uh, into southern Canada. And then if you basically blink, you miss it. These guys are very quick migrants here. So you see a slight orange blush right there in Florida, and that's in May. And then when they come back down, uh, the scarlet tanagers, there we go. A little bit of orange right there, the end of September, beginning of October. And so that's when the sightings of these guys are going to come uh, around here. Uh, similar thing, savannah sparrows here, you know, same deal. In the winter, there's huge densities in the south, and then come summertime, they all push north. And it's just a cool visualization of how these huge populations can move um, on the continent sort of wide scale. 
Uh, this might be a range map you're more interested, you're more usually, you know, used to seeing. Uh, that's something you'd see in a field guide. Here's for a yellow rumped warbler. Um, and so here we can see the color over Florida is blue, and that means they're found in Florida in the winter. Um, so you're not going to see them for the next couple of weeks, and then they'll be here pretty much until maybe March or April, and then they'll be gone all summer while they're breeding up in Canada. Um, if you look in field guides, usually purple is kind of the color they use for year-round residents. Something like the black-bellied whistling duck here hangs out all year round. Really no migration or movement for these guys. And then the white pelicans, we talked about them briefly earlier with the bar charts. The cool thing with the pelicans here is when they're in Florida in the winter, you can see them even mingling with brown pelicans. You know, they're on the coast, maybe lagoons, um, you know, eating fish, things like that, doing their pelican thing. And you'd think, oh, maybe they're going up to, um, you know, the coast somewhere, um, you know, like, uh, like brown pelicans generally do. But these guys actually, they nest up in like the upper Midwest, places like Yellowstone, the Tetons, Oregon, um, Southern Canada. And so the, the white pelican is actually more of like a, a lake and river specialist, not a coastal bird. It's kind of interesting. It's only in Florida in the winter. And then one of the few summer visitors to Florida that really doesn't stay all year round is that swallowtailed kite. And they're here in the summertime and they really like it hot because um, they don't just go down to Central America. In the winter, our winter for like December, January, they skip all the way over the equator and then go into like Southern Brazil, Bolivia, places like that, Uruguay. And so they essentially have summer all year round. Uh, and they just kind of hop around to wherever is summertime. And so those are ones that have already left Florida. They're leaving now, and we're not going to see them again until probably next May. So when we talk about population-wide sort of movements, though, it can be a little bit confusing uh, and tricky to pin down where each individual bird is going. And so here's a little hypothetical range map um, of a bird. And let's say it's summers in Western Canada and Alaska. Um, it's resident year round in Washington, Oregon, and then it winters in California here. So now there's three different ways we could kind of visualize how each individual bird is moving. We might have birds in the north end of the range in the summer. Um, let's say they're moving from all over Western Canada in the summertime, and then the whole range just shifts. Every bird um, of this species just shifts, let's say, like 400 miles south in the winter. And so that would be chain migration, that kind of middle version of those two of those three arrows there. And so that is it's one explanation for how birds move. Maybe all the birds just move a little bit south and north. Another option um, of how they move is that maybe their residents, they've set up shop. They, they have territories, they have nests, um, they know where all the good food is. And so maybe the residents in like Oregon and Washington, maybe they stay there year round. And because they've already kind of blocked off that spot as their own, they kind of force the ones that winter in California to fly all the way over and then summer in Alaska. And that would be leapfrog migration, where the ones from the bottom of the population fly all the way up to the top. Um, and you could also have kind of a mix of this as well, where you've got stuff all over the place and they're just shifting and contracting the range. Um, and it's not all hypothetical. It is difficult to track this, but we have there is evidence that different species use different types of migration. So all of these things do actually happen in nature. Sometimes I think yellow throats, um, the one of the warblers, I'm pretty sure yellow throats are one that do leapfrog migration where the ones that go way far north end up way far south and the ones in the middle kind of just stay put. So, but a lot of this migration happens at night. So it's really difficult to to kind of quantify this and keep track of what's going on. So how do we keep track of all these birds that are flying around at night high up in the sky? One of the cool new technologies we've been using to detect them is actually Doppler radar. It's like, you know, if you're going to be detecting weather patterns and thunderstorms on a clear night, there shouldn't be anything in the sky, but these, um, the Doppler radar systems, they actually detect when birds are flying by. There's so many birds that migrate during peak migration, let's say April and May, and September, October, there's so many birds up there in the sky that these um, big, large-scale sort of um, this technology, the radar, can detect these masses of birds moving through. 
And so if you go online, I think it's BirdCast. If you Google BirdCast, you can actually find these sort of maps and forecasts of bird migration. And it's really cool. Um, they're just kind of coming out with more and more um, of this sort of stuff. I think this is a relatively new in the last 10 years sort of uh, field of study is using the radar to track um, large scale migration. So why are we migrating these huge distances anyway? You know, we've got these tiny little birds they are like the size of a mouse sometimes, and they're going th sometimes thousands of miles. That seems like a lot of energy to put in um, to migrate across the country. Well, the biggest reason that we've already touched on a little bit is food. You know, of course, up north, if you're in Alaska or Canada in the wintertime and you want to eat bugs and frogs, you're going to be out of luck. Um, there's just not very many bugs up there when there's three feet of snow on the ground. And so if you're going to breed up in Alaska, then for wintertime, you're going to want to move all the way down to Texas, Florida, Central America, and follow where the food is. Um, because, you know, obviously it's more stable. Uh, food levels are more stable. The temperature is more stable than the tropics. And so there's food pretty much year round. But then that kind of leads us to another question. If there's food year round in the tropics, why is anybody going up to Alaska? Why bother flying a thousand miles up, you know, through Florida and then up through into New England uh, to just, you know, eat bugs for a couple months? Well, for, for one thing, there's way more bugs. You know, it's very, there's a huge density of bugs up north concentrated into the short summer season. And so places like Alaska and boggy areas in Canada, they're just crazy mosquito-y. I've been up there and you just are covered with mosquitoes. It's worse than like the Everglades. It's, it's unbelievable how many mosquitoes are up there. But that's like the base of the food chain for all of these birds that go up there. And it's enticing enough that they want to head up there every summer. And the other big thing for summer is you want to migrate to find breeding grounds. You want enough food to feed your young and, you know, and power, you know, your breeding season, having eggs. Um, but you also need actual nesting sites. And one of the limiting factors in how many birds can exist in a given area is actually availability of places to put your nest. You know, it seems like there's plenty of trees out there, but many species of birds are very picky about the conditions and habitats of where they put their nests. And so birds um, have evolved to migrate long distances, both to track food and also to have the exact right habitat that they like to set up their territories and nest. So how do we know how to fly these far distances? You know, how do these birds navigate all the way from, let's say, Cuba through Florida all the way up into Ontario or something? You know, that's a huge distance to cover. Um, and I don't think they're using, you know, the GPS and maps and things like that. So the first thing, you know, you think about how do you navigate, you know, in general, if you're taking a walk, how do you make sure you don't get lost? And birds do the same thing. The first thing that they use is landmarks, visual cues. You know, birds will use the coast, the coastline, and they'll just follow the coastline up, or they'll follow a mountain ridge like the Appalachians or the Rocky Mountains, um, or the Mississippi River. A lot of these are corridors, known migration paths, where a big bulk of certain bird species will follow one major geographic sort of, um, or topographic sort of thing, like the Appalachian Mountains. Like that flame chart with the scarlet tanagers seemed like they were really following the Appalachians all the way up to their breeding grounds. Um, but what if it's really foggy or cloudy or it's nighttime? You know, we said most birds are migrating at night. You can't use landmarks if it's really dark out. And so now we've got like these six other things that birds can use to navigate. So one of them uh, is the geomagnetic compass. And so birds can actually tap into the Earth's magnetic fields, essentially. Uh, it's been shown that homing pigeons especially have like these cool magnetic flecks essentially in their brain. And they can really lock in on Earth's magnetic field and they know where due north is, um, or magnet, where magnetic north is, and they can orient relative to that north-south line. And there's definitely evidence that other birds do this as well. Another thing that birds use is the sun position, um, you know, rises in the east, sets in the west. Uh, in the summertime, it's up high. In the winter, it stays down low, at least in, you know, in the northern hemisphere. Um, 
And so birds use the different positions of the sun at different times of the day to kind of figure out where they are and what time of the year it is. Um, same thing uh, at night, they'll use the stars. Um, but it's actually been shown they don't use individual constellations as much. You know, they're not sitting there in the tree identifying the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. What their birds are really doing is they're orienting around the North Star. They're watching and basically seeing where all of the stars are rotating around a fixed point. And so in the Northern Hemisphere, we call that the North Star. And all the other stars appear to rotate around it. And so the birds can lock in on that and they know to fly kind of in that direction and they'll fly north using that. Another interesting one is plain polarized light. Birds can use polarized light. Um, and so if the sun's not perfectly visible, if it's cloudy out, there's still light polarization coming in as you know reflected light off of um, the clouds, off of the water thing, you know, just the general environment. There's this polarization to the light that we can't really detect. We've pretty much lost our sense of uh, detecting polarized light in humans. There's a little bit of a vestigial one in there. Uh, if you want to Google that, it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's kind of in there. Uh, the best way for us to visualize it is if you have polarized sunglasses, um, you know, and you use those so that you can maybe drive uh, and eliminate glare. And that's because the polarization in the sunglasses uh, goes this horizontal way, uh, where it's basically little lines of darkness, essentially, that are really, really tiny, thin lines. And it blocks out any light that is plain polarized in that same orientation as the sunglasses. And so that happens to block out the light, you know, reflecting off of flat surfaces like puddles off of the road, things like that. And so it's kind of a cool experiment you can try. If you take your sunglasses and you turn them 90 degrees, all of a sudden those glares aren't blocked anymore. Um, you can, you know, you can see the, all of those bright lights. You see reflections instead of seeing down into the water. Um, and this is getting a little bit of off topic, but another cool thing to try as just an experiment is if you have sunglasses that are polarized and you look at a rainbow and it's nice and vibrant, if you turn the sunglasses 90 degrees or you turn your head 90 degrees, the rainbow totally disappears because of the, the manner in which that light is polarized. But anyway, um, two other interesting things that are a little bit less well-founded, uh, but there is still evidence that birds use them are infrasound and smell. And so these, you know, the infrasound is actually the thought that birds can hear from miles away large scale sounds, things like waves hitting a coast or the wind over the Appalachian Mountains. And so they can use these to orient a little bit when they can't actually directly see the coast. And then smell, you can kind of imagine how this one works. Um, you know, if you're driving to the beach and you roll down the windows, even before you can see the water, a lot of times you can smell that salty smell in the air. Or if you're driving towards a swamp, you can smell it in the air. And so humans, we don't really think about using smell to navigate, but it's definitely in there. You know, we can, we can use that smell to think, okay, we're, we're getting close to the beach over here. Maybe there's a swamp over here. We can smell, smell that kind of pond algae smell. Um, and so these are all different tools in the, the bird navigation sort of toolbox. So even if it's like super foggy and the birds can't see anything, they can use at least a couple of these. And the cool way that scientists have figured out that birds use all of these different uh, sort of techniques in way and ways to um, navigate is with something called an Emlyn funnel. It's basically a little cage and you can put the bird and it doesn't hurt the bird at all. You put the bird in a little cage with a little paper funnel. So the bird tries to hop up onto the paper funnel in any direction that it wants to go. And you put an ink pad at the bottom. So little bird's feet get all inky and you put the bird in the cage. And if it wants to go north, it keeps hopping on the funnel, on the paper to the north side of the funnel. And you get a bunch of little inky bird footprints on the north side of the funnel. And you can kind of see, oh, that bird wants to go north. And if you keep that bird in the lab, uh, maybe you caught it in a mist net in the springtime and it wanted to go north, you keep it in the lab and then you put it back in the Emlyn funnel in the fall. Once the sun position has changed enough, the bird uses the sun position um, as its cue to start wanting to go south, it'll start trying to hop in the opposite direction. It'll start trying to go south. And it's really cool. You can use this technique to figure out exactly what angle the birds are trying to go at because it's not due north and south. You know, a lot of birds will fly maybe southeast until they hit the Atlantic Ocean and then they'll just follow the coast. Or maybe they'll fly 
almost due west to hit the Pacific and then follow California down to Mexico. And so you can kind of figure out all of these cool fine scale sort of angles and these different little behaviors. And the Emlyn funnel is one of these cool um, techniques that we have used to figure this out. And one of the things that it has kind of shown us is that some birds, they kind of, they get a little bit confused they get messed up in different ways. And we can actually predict uh, some of these confusions and that doesn't really make sense yet, but it will in a second. So here there's, you can think of birds getting confused and not knowing where to fly in two ways. You can think of them being disoriented. They don't know where to go. You know, they're all confused, maybe genetically or developmentally something went wrong and a new, a young bird just doesn't really know where to fly. And so he's disoriented. That makes sense. Um, and so they might just show up anywhere, you know, there might be a vagrant somewhere, um, but the other thing that can happen, and it's actually much more common, is misoriented birds. And so birds that are misoriented, they try and fly in a certain direction. They're not flying all over the place. They're not confused per se. They are trying to fly in one direction, but it's the wrong direction. And so what happens there is, let's say a bird is oriented based on their, you know, based on the Earth's magnetic field. They're trying to go from north where they hatched down south. Let's say they start in like North Dakota. And if they're supposed to fly southwest to California, sometimes either for genetic or developmental reasons that we don't really understand yet, sometimes they fly at a perfect mirror image to that. Instead of southwest, they'll fly southeast. And so in, you know, you'll have these vagrant birds that are supposed to fly west, and they'll end up in the Gulf of Mexico or in Florida. And it's really cool because it's, you can tell they're not disoriented. Because if you catch them and try and release them, they keep trying to fly in the same direction. And you also get way larger numbers of vagrant species at like an exact mirror image place to where they're supposed to be going. You know, so we don't have a whole bunch of birds just randomly going everywhere and we find them all over the place. We have the birds nesting here and they try, most of them fly to California like they're supposed to, but a bunch of them end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's like this perfect mirror image, something just developmentally went wrong. And it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. Why do you think some of them might fly the wrong way? What could screw up something as broad scale as like the magnetic fields of the earth? There's some new research actually done by one of my best friends right now. He's working on his PhD on how migratory birds orient and how geomagnetic storm, you know, these giant solar flares and auroras and all these big geomagnetic events can affect how they orient themselves. And so, you know, the, the data is still not in yet. Uh, I'll ask him, you know, how he's doing in his PhD. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll have all the data. Um, but it's really cool. He's going out and literally right now he's catching birds uh, for fall migration. He's setting up these big cages, these like Faraday cages with big copper wire loops and essentially it doesn't hurt the birds at all. But what it does is it is he's experimentally changing it. So he makes the birds think, oh, Earth's magnetic field is like over here instead of over here. And we can then look using like Emlyn funnels and other behavioral assays. We can see which way the birds want to go uh, based on these different sort of geomagnetic cues. Really cool, very new sort of research um, to think about. So we'll quickly go through a little bit of what birds are up to spring and summer before we kind of finish with fall migration. We're almost halfway through here. So for spring migration, um, a lot of colorful birds pass through Florida on their way north. Um, and especially, you know, some of the best, or not necessarily the best, but some of the prettiest, in my opinion, are the warblers and the vireos. Uh, and these guys are ones that pass through just in spring and fall. They don't really linger in Florida too much nice breeding plumage, but they're in a rush in the spring. They're trying to get up north and breed. They want to set up territories. And so spring migration is usually a bit faster. Um, birds don't want to linger and just eat, you know, they don't just go where the food is in spring. They really are trying to get there. They've got a goal. Uh, some more species that just pass through um, that you only see in migration, orioles, bobolinks, flycatchers, and thrushes. And they're all heading up to their breeding ground so that they can start courting, they can find mates, set up nests, you know, have little young, 
raise little babies, and eventually just start fledging. And all of this is kind of happening between May, June, sometimes into July. July's a little late. And then fall migration, that's the main topic of today's talk here. Finally, we're at fall migration. And that really actually started back in July. You know, you think of July as pretty much dead summer, but shorebirds specifically, they start migrating pr pretty early. And so shorebird migration really starts ramping up in late July through August. And then right now it's probably just about at its peak. Uh, but luckily, you know, you haven't missed you haven't missed anything yet, especially because Florida um, has a lot of wintering shorebirds. So even though a lot of the shorebirds might be migrating through here, I'm in Oregon right now, uh, the shorebirds might be migrating past me and they might already be mostly gone. Uh, but in Florida, they're going to stay there. A lot of them, a lot of the species of shorebirds stay all winter uh, round. And so for the next few weeks or even a couple months, if you go to somewhere like Gandy Boulevard down near St. Pete, not far from Brooker Creek, um, the west end of that bridge, the Gandy Bridge, um, you can go there and see dowichers, sandpipers, plovers, gulls, terns, uh, and those are birds that mostly were not there all summer and have just probably just now arrived. Other species to expect in fall, um, a lot of them are pretty much the same as what you'd expect in the springtime. Flycatchers, wood peewees, um, those guys have started showing up probably in the last couple of weeks, and the peak is probably between now and mid-October. Um, so, you know, flycatchers are notoriously difficult to ID even when they're singing, so brush up on your calls if you want to try and identify some of these guys. Um, we mentioned the tree swallows. Um, in with the flame charts, remember we saw that they kind of gather in winter in Florida. Uh, here we can see using those bar charts that pretty much all the species of swallows are also either migratory or, or overwintering in Florida. Uh, and that makes sense again that, you know, they like to eat bugs. The bugs aren't really going to be up north um, in the winter time, And so they pass through or stick around in Florida. Uh, thrushes, they're another big group. Uh, that really don't breed or winter in Florida in general and are really only here during migration. Uh, so you want to be on the lookout for Swainson's thrush, veeries, wood thrushes, um, and robins. You know, robins pretty much, you know, you think of them as kind of a general common bird. Um, and if you're up in New England or something, they're one of the most common birds um, for most of the year. But in Florida, they're pretty much absent in the summer. And so robins might just be showing up in a few weeks. And then they'll hang out pretty much all winter. So let's look at some of the pictures of some of these guys. So here, these are some of the shorebirds that have probably just about shown up in Florida now, and they should be there all winter. Uh, I think I took pretty much all these pictures at Gandy Beach um, and the Gandy Bridge there. You've got least sandpiper on the top left, semi-palmated sandpiper, dunlin on the bottom left, and piping plover on the bottom right. So these are all different shorebirds that you can go see all through the winter. Uh, these guys are ones that'll pass through a little bit faster. These guys won't stay the winter. Things like bobolinks, orioles, flycatchers, and thrushes. Uh, but then also add to that tanagers, grosbeaks, warblers. A lot of those guys are going to be going through and then just kind of heading over the Gulf of Mexico to Central and South America. Another cool group of birds that we haven't really mentioned yet much are raptors. And while Florida doesn't have a super high density of raptors during migration, most of the hawks and kestrels and things end up going through uh, Texas, down through Mexico, and then funneling through the isthmus of Central America. Um, one thing that Florida does have is actually a really high density of peregrine falcons. And if you go down, there's a, uh, a migration, like a hawk watching spot in the Keys. And down there in spring and fall migration, uh, you can see a lot of peregrine falcons. And during the peak migration, so for probably the next few weeks, if you were to go down to the Florida Keys at this site and hang out with them in all their spotting scopes, and you know there's birders that work there and count all these birds that go by, uh, the daily tally of peregrine falcons can be over 500. And so just like every minute or two, you'll have a peregrine falcon flying by like all day. And I think I think they had a they set the world record in 2015. I think they said they had 1,500 peregrine falcons in one day, which is really kind of cool. 
for such a cool big bird to see that many of them. Um, of course, if you really want to see those, you know, streaming clouds of hawks migrating, then you're really going to have to go somewhere like Central America. Um, Veracruz in Mexico, where I took this picture, that's really the place to go if you want to see huge numbers of broad-winged hawks, Swainson's hawks. Uh, my friends and I, I think we counted 18,000 hawks fly by us in an hour or two uh, at this mountaintop in Central or Southern Mexico. Um, interesting note on the warblers though, you know, I mentioned for the spring migration side of things, the warblers and the vireos are super colorful and pretty. Uh, so they're one of my favorite things to see. Uh, but in fall migration, you know, you can still see lots of different species, but you don't want to get your hopes up too much that you'll see all the really pretty colorful ones because a lot of them have lost their breeding plumage. Uh, so here we've got on the left, black-throated blue warbler and Blackburnian warbler. And we've got their breeding plumage males on the left. And then those drab brownish yellow guys on the right, those are the same species, but those are what you would see migrating through in the fall and then down into winter. And so uh, you can see a lot of really cool species in Florida in the fall. It's probably one of the best times if you want to get as many species as possible on a list. Fall is probably the best time to be in Florida, um, but it is not necessarily the most photogenic, I must say. And in addition to these nice breeding color, you know, the males losing their breeding plumage, you also have this big influx of juveniles that are not all colorful yet. And the juveniles generally lag behind a little bit. Um, they can look similar to the non-breeding males or the females. So it can be a little bit more difficult in the fall to tell if you have um, males, females, or juveniles that you're seeing. Whereas in the springtime, it's quite clear that you've got you know, males in breeding plumage and females in their slightly drabber plumage. Uh, this here is a common yellow throat. Um, you know, it's pretty plain, you know, not in terms of color. It's got the nice yellow throat and belly, uh, but there's not really any streaking or markings or anything. And so the yellow throats are one that once you learn them, they can be pretty easy to identify. Another cool thing to check out in Florida in the fall are vagrants. Um, and so just like with those disoriented or misoriented birds, there are, you know, some species that are just more likely to end up in Florida in the fall, often as juveniles. Um, and there are consistently numbers of Swainson's hawks and Western tanagers, um, and also things like lark sparrow and brown cap flycatcher. Those are typically, you know, Western birds that aren't really supposed to spend any time in Florida, but pretty consistently in the fall, you get numbers of these guys showing up in Florida. And so if you're out there birding and you see something that just doesn't really look right, you know, take a picture, take some notes, um, because fall migration is a great time to find some rare birds that have shown up. So we mentioned that, you know, they've lost their breeding colors. Uh, why did, you know, why do some of these birds look different? Here's a yellow rumped warbler. Nice pretty male, you know, spring and summer looks all handsome with his black and gray and yellow. Come fall and winter when he's hanging out in Florida, he looks pretty drab and brownish gray. Uh, but they look different, you know, because they're molting. They change their feathers. Um, you know, it, it's energetically, it's pretty costly to have all, you know, these bright, colorful feathers. You're very obvious to predators, you know, and maybe that's good if you want to attract a mate or if you want to lure predators away from your nest. Uh, but if it's fall and winter and you're not trying to raise young, then there's not really any advantage to being super colorful. And so a lot of birds, uh, they molt out of their nice colorful plumage uh, come fall. And that's why by the time they're heading through Florida, we see them as these kind of browner, more camouflaged individuals. And usually that means the males will then look more like the females, especially in the case of things like warblers and tanagers. And it can be a little confusing. It can make warblers look similar. It can make Things, you know, a lot of sparrows look similar, um, and it can be a little bit tough to keep track of, uh, especially with molt. And so I'd say fall is one of the more frustrating times, honestly, to go birding. Um, but it can also be very rewarding if you learn all of the birds and their different molting patterns, and you can see, oh, that one looks like this, but you know, because of the, the streaks versus spots or something, you know, you've got one species or another. And so I, I kind of like the challenge. That's part of the fun. Um, another bird that is one of the more confusing ones. This one doesn't migrate 
Um, but I just tossed it in here because this is one of the most easily confusable birds in Florida. I'd say I've, you know, most questions about, you know, what bird is this, or I think this is something and it's mis ID'd. Uh, a lot of them in Florida are this bird and it's the little blue heron. And it's really confusing because it starts out life up in the top left there as pure white looking kind of like a snowy egret or a cattle egret. And then eventually it'll molt through this cool ghostly white blue phase and eventually into its full adult plumage. Um, but that can be very confusing uh, if you see that pure white one and you in, you know kind of initially think that it's an egret. Uh, the best way to ID this guy, just as an aside, um, is look at its face. Egrets, you know, the snowy egrets have yellow lures, yellow skin near their beak, much sharper beak as well. This guy has kind of a slightly curved, a little bit more blunt beak than a snowy egret. Uh, so if you look at the beak and the legs, um, then you can pretty much ignore all of the white feathers and you can tell you've got a little blue heron here. Um, so, but for molting, you know, birds are molting right after the breeding season's done. Uh, they, you know, put a lot of energy into having eggs, finding food for their young. And so it, you know, it's energetically, it's very costly to have a nest and raise young. And so you don't want to have all of your feathers falling out and not really be able to fly well um, when that's happening. But you also don't want to be molting all of your flight feathers for migration. And so what a lot of birds will do is they'll molt fully pretty much right before fall migration. And so right after the breeding season, they'll look a little bit more raggedy. Um, they'll quickly molt, um, not all at once because, you know, they don't want to be like a penguin hopping around on the ground, but they will quite quickly molt through, you know, in succession, different flight feathers. As you can see, they'll usually molt one or two flight feathers at a time until they're nice and brand new. Um, they're not like grasshoppers. Here I've got, a you know, one of those locusts that you see in Florida pretty commonly. Birds can't just shed all their feathers at once and then regrow. Um, like, you know, they don't just molt a whole exoskeleton. They kind of do this more sequential thing. Um, and so birds are unlike, you know, snakes that shed skin or insects that can molt like this. They have to do it a little bit more slowly and methodically. But usually it's timed so that it's not happening at the same time as migration or nesting because those are the kind of energetically costly periods. Actually, one exception that you should Google later, I don't have a slide of this, but one exception to that is what's called catastrophic molt. And it's there's one group of birds that does basically molt pretty much all their feathers all at once and they look ridiculous when they do it. And it's because they don't need their feathers to fly. And it is actually penguins. And penguins, uh, if you look up pictures of penguins, like the babies turning into adults, the catastrophic molt is just hilarious. They look like an exploded pillow. Definitely Google that later, it's adorable. Okay, so birds have molted. Birds are migrating down through the fall. And a lot of the birds end up lingering here because in the fall, they're not rushing to get to a breeding uh, spot. They're not trying to claim a nesting site. So in the fall, they're really more just trying to find warm weather and reliable food. And so a lot of birds will kind of slow down. They'll go slower during fall migration than they will in spring. And they'll end up lingering in Florida. And so a lot of uh, Florida's fall migrants are also Florida's wintering birds. Things that we've already mentioned, palm warblers, um, the red-breasted merganser is one that, you know, doesn't want to be trying to swim around on frozen rivers and lakes up north. And so a lot of them will come down to Florida in the winter. And then shorebirds, and we've mentioned the white pelicans. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Let's talk about some spots to go birding. We want to go see all these guys, right? So, heck, this weekend, you can go to some of these local spots. I've got a few spots here that are less than an hour away from Brooker Creek and Tampa. Um, and so these spots, not all of them are prime for migration. I'll talk about which ones are the best. Uh, but all of these, these six spots here are some great spots to go see some of the local birds. Uh, the first one, of course, I just mentioned Brooker Creek, of course. Um, nowadays, as you can see by the satellite map and just looking around in general, there's so much urban sprawl. There's so many people, so much ag land, you know, agriculture land that's kind of crops and things that any little patches of real forest with native habitat, any patches of that that's left and visible from the sky, they're like an oasis for migrating birds. And so Brooker Creek there under the one, and then over to the three near Lettuce Lake and the Lower Hillsborough Wilderness Preserve, those 
are great migrant traps because birds are flying down Florida. They're stuck in this peninsula. They're kind of funneling down here as they go south. And they just see tons of people. They see farmland. They see highways. And they're trying to figure out where to land um, to spend the day because they're mostly migrating at night. And so thing, places like Brooker Creek and Lettuce Lake are great places during fall and spring migration um, because you can get plenty of warblers and vireos, uh, birds that really want to hang out in these woodsy areas. And then the other spot here that I would really mention for migration specifically is Honeymoon Island State Park out there on the left, number six. Uh, because a lot of birds do use coastlines you know, as one of their visual cues, they migrate right along the coast. Uh, it's easy to just stay north south and not get lost that way. And a lot of them are kind of island hopping. They're using these barrier islands along the coast of Florida. And so a lot of them can funnel into some of these little barrier islands like Honeymoon Island. And so if you go there, um, especially if it's like cloudy or rainy, or if there's a northerly wind, you know, all of these are weather patterns that make the birds not really want to migrate much, you know, if that makes sense. If there's a big storm ahead, you know, in the springtime, birds, they really can't wait too much because they want to get to the breeding grounds. In the fall, though, they want to take it easy a little bit more. So if there's wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico and it'd be really hard to fly over the Caribbean, the birds are a lot more likely to just kind of hunker down and keep eating and fattening up. And so some of the best days to go find a bunch of uh, fall migrants uh, would be kind of cloudy, stormy days or when day, uh, days when the wind is coming out of the south and heading north. And those are the days you'd want to go to somewhere like Honeymoon Island, where there's a whole bunch of birds funneled into one spot. Now, if you're really interested in trying to find some more of these birds, here are some slightly further afield spots, you know, maybe a couple hours drive away, but definitely worth it if you really, really want to see a lot of birds. Uh, the closest one to Brooker Creek would be Sanibel Island. It's, uh, it's pretty similar to Honeymoon Island in that regard. It's, you know, birds are coming down the Gulf Coast of Florida, and they just kind of funnel into these barrier islands. It's a great place to go. And then one of the most famous spots, actually, it's an incredible spot for fall migration particularly, is Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park right off the coast of Miami on Key Biscayne. Um, again, it's just a matter of geography. The birds are flying down the coast, down the Atlantic coast. There's a lot of them that just kind of use, use that coastline. And then Miami is right there. They see this big city. They don't want to go into the city. They stay right on the coast. And there's this little peninsula where Bill Bags is. And it funnels hundreds or even thousands of birds into this one little spot. So if you go there on a kind of a rainy morning in, let's say, mid-October, you can see hundreds and hundreds of warblers and vireos and grosbeaks all just filling the trees there. And then it's the same sort of story for, you know, Southern Everglades or all the way down in Key West, you know, in Key West, especially because that's kind of their last stop before they have to make the big hop, you know, over to Cuba and then further down into like South and Central America. So those are a lot of good spots to try out to go birding. I know that was a lot of information we went really quickly. Um, I'll leave it over this recap here so you guys can kind of, you know, absorb some of that information. Feel free to write down any questions or comments, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. We covered a lot of information, but hopefully, hopefully you guys took away some, some cool facts about fall migration. Thank you, Brian. That was fascinating as always. Um, we do have a couple questions, and if anyone else has any, please feel free to put them in the Q&A now. Our first question is, um, do we know how birds sense the magnetic direction? Yeah, it's it's very difficult to imagine a sense that we don't have, you know, thinking about, you know, snakes sensing heat and things like that. Uh, so there are studies with homing pigeons. Um, you know, they're kind of the classic case of birds that are really good at finding where they are and things. And so you can, there are actually magnetic sort of flex. There's like iron in their brains. There's like actually magnetic particles somehow in their actual anatomy. And it's def it's thought, you know, it's not very well understood still, but it is thought that this is somehow um, how they can orient themselves at least to the north-south lines with Earth's magnetic fields. Um, but it is, it's still up in the air pretty much if birds are sensitive enough to the magnetic fields to be disrupted by things like solar flares and 
auroras, like I mentioned. That's that's kind of a you know in the future we'll see if that actually happens. Um, but what would be actually really interesting is if if and when the Earth's magnetic field like flips, you know, if North and pole, South Pole flip, because that happens every you know few thousand or million years. Um, Earth's poles do flip, and it would be very interesting to see if you know bird migration gets really screwed up for decades or something when that event occurs um that would be really interesting to see because yeah it, it is just really really not well known thank you and do you know a good spot to see cedar wax wings cedar wax wings yeah so a lot of them i always think of them more up north um cedar wax wings uh, they like to eat berries and bugs they can be pretty nomadic. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, you'll see hundreds of them and then all of a sudden you'll see none for a while. Uh, specifically for Florida, I would say your best bet would be to go on eBird. And sorry, I don't have a, you know, a specific location off the top of my head for you. But if you go on eBird.net or eBird.org, sorry, um, go on eBird and go to species maps and then go, you know, type in cedar wax wings and see where people have been seeing them. That's the best thing about eBird is if you want to try and find a bird, you can just type it in and you can pretty much know where to go. Um, and so I would definitely point you towards eBird um, and that'll really help you narrow down some very specific spots and what times of the year to go to those spots. Um, but yeah, Reseda Raxwing can be pretty nomadic and so they can be sometimes tough to pin down. Thank you. Um, and this person said they had read somewhere that birds can fly while part of their brain sleeps. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's awesome. That's my thought on it. <laughs> it's it's really cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I've def I've read that uh, an article, you know, either that article or a similar one, especially for long long distance migrants, um, especially over long you know oceans where you don't really have to think very much. You know, you're just over the you know over the water. You're not really changing course. You're barely even flapping if you're using the wind. So things like terns, albatross, shearwaters, uh, golden plovers, these guys, and, and many uh, many other birds, I'm assuming, uh, we probably just don't even know fully. But yeah, it's, it's true. They can basically shut off part of their brain and fly just on autopilot, you know? Um, and that could be one of the reasons why vagrants um, are so prevalent when there's strong weather or winds, because if maybe if you're flying on autopilot and a big storm comes through, you're not really consciously navigating at all. You're really just kind of getting pushed around wherever the wind is pushing you. Um, but yeah, it's very cool. And, um, if you want to think about some of the really other interesting things that birds do while migrating or flying, um, look up, you know, just swifts, you know, chimney swifts and things like that. Some of them, they don't land for like years. <laughs> um, it's been calculated that, you know, swifts, they can sleep, drink, eat, and mate while flying. And so for the first couple of years of a swift's life before it breeds, it, I think it's been calculated that an individual swift might fly over a hundred thousand miles without landing. Um, just unreal. And I'm sure during much of that time, you know, animals need to sleep. I'm sure they were able to turn off their brain somehow a little bit. So yeah, very cool. Um, I can't really get my head around how I would turn off part of my brain. I don't know if it would just feel like sleep, um, but it's a very cool adaptation that definitely exists and allows birds to make these long distance travels. Awesome. Wow. That is so cool. Um, someone asked, what is the best food to put out? And I'll jump in with part of an answer real quick, but here at Brooker Creek, we always recommend the best thing you can do is plant native plants. Um, one important function of the Brooker, Brooker Creek Preserve is that we are a stopover site. So it's a place where the migrating birds as they come through have an abundance of native food. And do you wanna add anything to that, Brian? Um, yeah, sure. So one of the things that it can feel mean to take away food during the winter or in the fall, you know, you think it's getting cold, the birds need their food, but it can alter their behavior a little bit. Um, you know, you don't always want to have your hummingbird feeders, especially, you know, people up north, maybe not in Florida so much, but if you're living up in New England or Washington or Oregon, um, if you have your hummingbird feeders up all year round, 
there are actually some hummingbirds that will basically brave the snow and just stay around. Um, and it's not necessarily the best thing for them. Some of them will survive, but if you then go on vacation and that food su supply stops all of a sudden, then those birds won't be able to find food. And so, you know, it can be good to, you know, it can be fun to have bird feeders and it, you know, you know, I'm not necessarily against bird feeders in general, but definitely if you offer a lot of food, then you will be altering the kind of the natural behavior of birds. Um, and I would definitely agree that the best thing you could do would be to plant native plants. Don't mow your lawn and use pesticides. You know, my lawn looks like, like cra it's crazy over there. It, I've got gardens and, you know, native plants and weeds and grass, but it also means there's tons of bugs. And so there's birds to eat those bugs. Um, and so that's, that's the best thing. The most healthy environment you can provide is, you know, plant some sunflowers, you know, the birds can eat the sunflower seeds at the exact time of year when sunflowers are supposed to have seeds. Um, that'd be the most natural thing to do. Thank you. And is urbanization growth of cities in Florida and other states along the coast a concern for bird migration? Yes. Urbanization and overpopulation of people, that's one of the biggest concerns for pretty much all organisms everywhere, honestly. Um, and so you can, there's a, you know, there's a lot of different factors. It could affect migration in terms of they don't have these stopover sites like Burker Creek. Um, so birds might have to fly farther to find a good little oasis to settle down before they sleep. Um, you could also think of the lights at night as disorienting. Uh, and there's actually um, some interesting stuff. I think actually it probably just happened. I forgot to read about it. The on 9-11, they do like these memorial lights in New York City, these two big bright lights in Manhattan, at least they used to. And that would mess up bird migration. There were birders that would go and stand under these lights and look up and you could see like hundreds of birds kind of flying through these lights at night. And just the presence of really bright lights um, along the coast and along major migration paths can definitely alter and, you know, inhibit good, you know, travels and dispersal and migration. Um, it's also super bad for sea turtles uh, nesting, you know, having little baby sea turtles hatching and having big uh, bright high rises along the coast. Sea turtles see, you know, they're supposed to use the, the light of the moon and the reflection of the moon off the water so that sea turtles can hatch and head towards the water. But when there's a lot of urbanization and bright lights along the coast, like in Miami, sea turtles get confused and they turn around and they head up up the beach instead of down to the water and it's not good. Uh, so there's a lot of factors, uh, but yes, urbanization and all these big bright lights. Oh, and of course, hitting towers, birds flying into windows. Um, I've seen some articles about a proposed gigantic mirror wall in like the Middle East or Saudi Arabia that was like some solar thing that was like a hundred mile long mirror wall. That thing will basic, that would be just terrible um there's so many birds all of you know all of asia basically migrates through the middle east and israel and then migrates into africa and vice versa and if you have a giant mirror stretching across the desert that's going to kill millions of birds so i really hope that thing doesn't actually get built i don't know if other people have seen articles on that thing out there but it is it is just awful <laughs> yikes okay yeah. Um, I see one more question here. Um, what happens to the birds that stay in one place instead of migrating with their flock? Are they less healthy than the ones that migrate? Yeah, so there's a, you know, there's a few different reasons. It's possible that, you know, some birds have found a good food source or a bad food source if it's, you know, a lot of bird feeders. Um, and so some birds might linger or not migrate at all. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're injured, um, but it might not be natural behavior. You know, they might be hanging out um, farther north than usual because it's getting warmer. You know, climate change, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of birds maybe not migrating as early or returning north sooner. Um, and yeah, so I think there, there's a lot of different factors. Uh, it is definitely possible that if most birds leave and a few individuals linger, especially juvenile birds, it's possible that they are still fattening up. Maybe they're not as healthy um, they're not ready to make the, the journey yet, but it doesn't always mean they're doomed. You know, there's, it's staggered, you know, it, it takes some time 
And I, as I think I mentioned, juveniles will often linger behind their parents. Um, you know, they need to fatten up and strengthen, strengthen those flight muscles a little bit. And so if you see birds lingering behind and not migrating, um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they're sick, uh, though that is one possible explanation. Thank you. And that looks like all of our questions and there are a lot of comments coming in thanking you, Brian, and saying how much they enjoyed it and love the slides. So thank you very much for being here and sharing that all with us. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We're glad you could join us. Brian is going to be back next month to do advanced birding. So if you enjoyed this and want to come join us again, we will be here on October 18th at 2 p.m. Yeah, so thank you back, everyone. But yeah, it'll be new. There'll be some new stuff there too. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week and I hope everyone goes out and sees some birds. Thank you.